All right, everybody. Um, welcome to my presentation. Um, my presentation is about, yes, it's about Brexit. Uh, basically, what digital marketeers and Drupal can learn from the Brexit campaign. Um, it's a daily item in the news, Brexit. Uh, and many people wonder how we got into this situation and how we get out of it. The answer to the first question uh, can be answered, um, and there's a lot of lessons to be learned. Um, I cannot answer the second question. Um, I would like to state, and I can understand that this subject is a bit controversial, um, but you know this is about learning, uh, learnings to be taken from the Brexit campaign. Um, I would like to state that I'm not here to discuss Brexit um, and whether it's good or not. Um, I will refrain from any discussion around you know, Brexit in itself, whether it's good or not. Um, I'm here on my personal behalf as I am a board member of the Drupal Association and so I'm not representing the Drupal Association but representing myself, Michel van Veldi. I am the co-founder of One Shoe, a digital agency based in Utrecht, a creative and digital agency. I'm a brand strategist and a creative conceptor um, and uh, also co-founder of the Dutch Drupal community. All right, so let's have a look at the learnings from the Brexit campaign. Um, as I said, it's a daily item in the news um, and the question is, um, yeah, how do we get into it? You know, uh, what happened and what kind of, you know, actions were taken during the campaign? Um, I will give you insights in how the Leave campaign won the referendum and what Drupal can learn from it. Um, so, yeah, so, 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 so how did the Brits so, come, become so divided between the Leave and the Remain camp? Um, and the question is who's going to be the winner? And yes, I'm going to give my personal opinion here. There is no winner to my belief because you know, Britain is divided and when you are divided, to my opinion, they will remain divided for a long time, um, and then there's no winner, you know. And I feel very sorry for for both camps actually. Um, so, how did the Leave campaign win? You know, what and what can we learn from it? Um, you know, when we do Drupal projects, you know, and you probably think like, how can you combine that? Well, I can show you in a minute that we can learn from this. Okay, so the Brexit referendum was partly won by the use of innovative and groundbreaking uh, digital campaign techniques. Um, I'm not saying I condone the way they used it. Um, I wish they'd done it in a way you know, so you know the world can get rid of plastic or anything, but they, they did it in a way um, uh, that we can learn a lot of lessons from it. Um, whether we like it or not, the Brexit referendum provides insights in the future of digital marketing and I'm here so everybody's aware that there are digital marketing techniques being thrown at you so you can be aware of what's happening with you and your personal profiles. Um, so I'm going to provide some insights in the future of marketing, digital campaigns and content marketing um, and uh, well, well how did they win? Well it all started by Leave the Leave campaign hiring this fellow. Uh, Dominic Cummings. Uh, who knows this guy? Who, who's been reading about this guy? All right, it's okay. So that's good. Good bet. There's quite a few people who never heard of this guy. Okay, Dominic McKenzie Cummings, uh, born November 25, 1971. He's a British political strategist um, who's known as an avid advocate of Brexit. In 2015 and 16, um, he led the Vote Leave campaign, which fought for a British departure. Uh, from the EU and he played an active role in the 2016 referendum. Um, since July 2019 he's a special advisor to Prime Minister Boris Johnson. So when Johnson is around uh, you, you see this guy walking around there many many times. Alright so when you start a campaign or a project, um, a Drupal project, you have to find out who is your target audience. You have to decide who your target audience is um, so you can you know, create content that's compelling to that target audience, and whether it's for a campaign or a Drupal website. So the Leave campaign, they decided not to aim their arrows at the Brexit Leave voters. Why? 
they were already on board anyway. They also, also decided not to focus on the remain camp and try to convert them. You know, the focus would be on the indecisive voters. Dominic Cummings decided to use online um, as the most important channel for persuading the indecisive voters. Um, and he had only a couple of months to do so, so he was in a bit of a race to find out who the indecisive voters were. Um, the lesson we can learn from this is that each Drupal website when you start it, or each campaign when you start it, you have to start by identifying your target audience. So who is the persona? If you want to be truly successful, do not approach a project like a one-trick pony, use a standard template or a distribution that can be taken out of the closet. You know, because every single user is different, every persona is different, so you cannot approach it from a standardized way. That's why UX has become so big in our landscape, user experience. All right. So when this is a, a persona template we're using at, at, uh, at our company. Uh, so look at, for example, a developer. We are here at DrupalCon. So I've taken the, the, the persona developer. Um, so who are they? How would you describe them? What's their story? What are their needs? How do we meet and exceed those needs? Um, what do we want them to think? And what do we want them to say about us? And how do we want them to feel? So if you decide to make a persona list, you know, um, don't forget uh, there's always the press, who's also part of a, a really important persona. You know, so you have uh, the CMO, the CTO, the CFO, you've got your developers. And so there's a whole range of personas you can identify. Um, and uh, this is a standardized version of if you want to um, uh, uh, create a persona list. All right. Um, so it's really important. So Leaf decided to focus on the indecisive voters um, as they could bring them the majority vote. They knew that the, um, the only Leaf voters, that was the too small of a group, and they wanted to have the majority vote. More on this later. But what kept them awake at night was the question, why were they not deciding yet? What were the emotional triggers um, and what was needed to, to persuade them to vote for Leaf? You know, so you have a, a majority group in the UK, you have no idea um, why they are indecisive and you have no idea how to convert them into voting for leave. Now that was the big question and this is where Dominic Cummings became smart. I don't say it's good, but I say it's smart, just, just to be, be aware and stop any discussions later on. Okay, so Dominic Cummings, he went to investigate himself. Um, and entered into a dialogue. He literally went into the pub um, and asked a simple question, why don't you like the EU? Simple question, just in the pub, having a beer, having a laugh, and asking questions, why don't you like the EU? And he learned a valuable lesson there. There was not one important reason why some people had an aversion to the EU. People felt angry, people felt embarrassed, people did not see a better future in general, um, they did not like the legacy of the EU. People were online, but were feeling very lonely. Um, they did not trust the data presented by the EU, um, the EU Institute, and they also felt that the expansion of the EU was going too fast, and the EU was becoming too large. So there's a whole plethora of reasons why people did not like the EU, or even didn't feel, you know, right, you know, that people are out of a job, people were feeling misery, but they're online you know, and, and feeling lonely, you know. So he learned that he had to take a, an overarching message, you know. This in contrast, uh, this in contrast with the right-wing nationalists and the media who wanted immigration as the main theme, you know, when, when the whole discussion started, it was all about immigration, you know, we have to stop immigration, but that was the right-wing nationalist, and that was a small audience alone, that was not the majority vote. So the team decided to choose an all-transcending theme that appealed to both leave and, you know, appeal also to the frustration of the indecisive voters, and that was, the theme was take back control, and that was an overarching theme, you know, it was really touching the people right in their hearts, because people did not feel in control. So they, they decided you know, to, to touch them in their hearts and say, let's 
take back control. That was an overarching message which even surpassed the feelings of the EU. You know? And that's why they had an umbrella theme, as they call it. So if you want to reach your audience, choose a, an ideal that's an overarching message, um, and then stick to it. You know, there's one overarching message. I see so many campaigns happening where there's a Pretoria of messages, but all you need is just one, one overarching message. Really important. Then stick to it. So the second question Dominic and his team were facing that they did not know who the indecisive voter was. So who were they? You know, um, and they knew their frustrations, and they knew they had to identify them to win the majority vote. They needed insights, and at that time, they were approached by Cambridge Analytica um, via Robert Mercer. He was a billionaire who earned his money um, as a data scientist and uh, a hedge fund investor. Cambridge Analytica um, was a private British American data company that bundled data mining, data analyst analysis, and direct marketing with strategic communication purely for election campaigns. They did this around the globe, and they've been testing it. Uh, it started in 2013 as a subsidiary of the SEO group, and billionaire Robert Mercer, he was a hedge fund manager, owns part of the company with his family after an investment of millions. Now, he had a goal behind it, but that's something I don't go into in this presentation. Um, just, just start Googling on Robert Mercer, and you'll, you'll find it really interesting stuff. You can deep dive into it. Um, the company had offices in London, New York, and Washington. Um, in 2015, um, they started working on the campaign for Ted Cruz, and Ted Cruz only had about 4% vote against Hillary Clinton. So they started working for him, and they bumped it up to 44% using the same techniques as they used later on in the UK campaign. The problem was is that the algorithms they were using, they were not good enough, and they wanted to improve their algorithms, and they needed a, a large audience. Well, and here they came. The British came into the vote, you know, and then Robert Mercer thought, and Cambridge Analytica thought, hey, there's a whole large population there, maybe we can help them. So Cambridge Analytica approached Dominic Cummings um, uh, basically to work on the algorithms, and they did. Uh, so they offered their services to the Leave campaign. Uh, we all know what happened, and after that, they worked on the Trump campaign. We all know what happened then. All right, so they went for big data and building profiles. This included integration of data from social media, online advertising, websites, apps, direct mails, polls, online fundraising, and some other things, new things they tried, such as a new way of conduct pollings um, and adopt experts in physics and machine learning. So they had a whole team, um, and you know, this was all undisclosed to the rest of the, the, the Vote Leave teams that were working in a separate room um, basically setting up their whole campaign. Um, they applied data science in such a way that it was far above the standard analytic skills as applied in normal political campaigns. Um, and the Brexit campaign combined this data to get a detailed picture of what was going on. Um, so if you build a website, uh, think about starting with segmentation. You know, we already talked about personas, but you want to start with segmentation, and so you can provide the right content to the right personas, and building profiles within those segments, PS, only for a good purpose. You know, this is what I'd like to share with you. Okay, so let's have a look at a web shop segmentation example. Um, so you've got your active customers who have ordered something in the last 13 weeks. You've got your active customers who have not ordered anything in the last 13 weeks. You've got your active customers with a web shop account who have logged in in the last 12 months or active customers with a web shop account and active customers without a web shop account who are familiar with the brand or web shop. So if you want to grow your revenue, who are you going to focus on? Well, the fastest ROE can be achieved by campaigning and targeting segments one to five if you're in it for the short run. But if you want to grow market share in the long run and maintain your company, you should be focusing on group six to eight, which are active customers without a web shop account who are not familiar with the brand or web shop, inactive customers who have not previously purchased anything online but who are familiar with the brand or web shop, or inactive customers who have not previously purchased anything online and are not familiar with the brand or web shop. This is how 
you grow your audience. This is segmenting your audience, um, and if you do so, you can campaign them and grow your audience in a, as a whole. Um, a standard persona approach leads on average to twice as many leads as you conduct a campaign without personas. So if you start campaigning with personas, it will lead to twice the amount of leads. All right, so let's have a look. So, okay, so we have the undecided folder. We know who they are. We know they're frustrated. Well, we don't know who they are, but I mean, but we know they're frustrated and we have to build up profiles. This is where it gets dodgy. Yes, this is a personal opinion. Um, in order to persuade the undecided folder, the Leaf campaign had to find out their personal needs and frustrations. For this, they needed to gain insights in the, at, at the personal level into those needs and fears and frustrations in order to able to be to micro-target all those people. That, that's what they wanted to do. They did this using advanced software algorithms and serving attractive online ads in which questions were asked. They had to build profiles quickly as a matter of, in a matter of weeks or months. They had a really short time to index basically the, 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 the British population. Um, so they set up a campaign in which you could win 50 million pounds. That's a lot of money. You know, and it's really tempting not to, well, to basically to click on it. I want to win. And then you have to answer a couple of questions. By participating, uh, uh, Cambridge Analytica collected your IP address, left cookies, pixels, and connected this with social media profiles and stored all your data in a personal database. A personal database for every person in the UK. This is what they were doing. Um, so detailed profiles were created by linking the answer to IP addresses and everything and then they were um, uh, targeting them. One billion advertisements were generated and distributed during the campaign. Please note that the messages contained lies, and I do not condone this. This is for you know, uh, discussion purposes. You know, I do not condone this. Um, so they started off building up profiles by a winning campaign, and after that, they knew who you are and, and you know, what your frustrations were. And then they were started targeting you personally. These are two campaign examples. Some people were not happy with the spendings uh, uh, on the, uh, the NHS. And the other ones uh, uh, about the fact that Turkey was joining. Both were lies. And, you know, everybody knows it's, in, it's, in, it's been in the press. These were lies. So um, this is how they played upon their fears and frustration. Um, what we can learn from this, this is a, a bad version, but there are good versions as well, available on the market and everything. Um, Micro-targeting is successful. So personalization, you know, it's, it's a hot topic. You know, um, right here at DrupalCon, we're talking about personalization within Drupal. Uh, so personalization is a hot topic with marketeers. Micro-targeting is successful. And the question is, how can we organize a website in such a way that we can present personalized content? You know, we can serve people in a better way. Um, so how can we reach our target group as personally as possible? And the question is, what does Drupal have to offer in terms of personalization and recommendation? Well, the conclusion is not enough. We do not have, you know, enough means within Drupal to offer personalization and recommendation. So there's something as a community we can work on, there's something we can learn from. So the interesting bit is that digital alone, by reaching customers, you know, um, is not enough. Um, the models that were refined by the Leaf campaign were also used to produce dozens of different versions of the referendum brochure. 46 million folders. In the last 10 weeks, Brexiteers had more than 12,000 people at work. Doing, uh, doing this every week, and they had more volunteers than this, but the 12,000 were regularly active. Um, and they, the volunteers delivered over 70 million leaflets out of a, t a total of 125 that were delivered in one way or another, talking about the impact on the environment. You know, it's, uh, this is uh, there was a major impact on the environment alone. Um, the lesson we can learn from this is that you cannot make a difference by setting up just an online campaign. You know, um, when, when I talk to clients, we regularly have discussions on should it be uh, only mobile, uh, <coughs> only digital. No, if you want to reach your audience, um, you have to combine print and digital. <coughs> I'm sorry. You need boots on the ground, 
um, an integrated personalized campaign will eventually lead you to success. There's a picture of Boris Johnson handing out those brochures of the Leave campaign in front of a bus with a misleading message on it. Okay, so when we look at the future, um, and when we look at the future of marketing, um, in the past, you, uh, creative agencies came up with a creative campaign, they were broadcasting it on television and everything. The world is changing. The world is changing into digital, the, the, uh, and the way uh, marketing is changing, it is changing into a data science era. So when you think of it, a lesson we can learn is that marketing, uh, marketing communication is all about persuasion. It's, that's always been fact. But it's also uh, not going to be led by creativity, it's going to be led by data, not by creativity <coughs> or gut feeling alone. So if you want to be successful, even as an agency, I tell everybody, please start hiring data scientists, not marketeers. All right. Um, marketeers, this is lessons for Drupal. I came up, this is my personal lessons. Marketeers want to reach uh, an audience uh, with a personal message and the Drupal community needs to focus on the needs of the user, which is nowadays a lot the marketeer. Uh, personalization is key, uh, but something Drupal is not offering yet. You know, there is a personalization model, but it's not up to par. Um, there are uh, some companies offering it yet, um, and I think uh, an open source version of that should be available. Uh, content recommendation should be the ambition, and data-driven content management should be the future. And I was delighted to see Dries talking about data in his keynote as well. So I think we're right on track on that with a shared ambition. So that is the learnings we have for Drupal. So you probably think, okay, you know, how do I get you know, all this information? Well, there's two really cool films to be watched. One is on Netflix. It's called The Great Hack. Um, but I suggest if you can find it, um, uh, watch the movie. It's called Brexit, The Uncivil War, which will tell you the story about Dominic Cummings and how he set up a campaign. And then afterwards, watch The Great Hack. You will have about three to four hours of really interesting movies to watch and you'll be thrilled and excited and you know you have stomach pain afterwards like oh my god what happened there all right um dominic cummings you know he's been really open you know he, he even uh, open sourced part of the the software he used for the campaign uh, it's on uh, on github um you can find it via dominic cummings blog um it, it, it's really interesting the guy is very, very smart. That makes him also, I think, personal opinion, quite dangerous. Uh, but if you read his, his blog, you'll be, uh, you'll be diving into his world and, uh, and his knowledge. It's, uh, it's, it's tough read sometimes, but uh, very, very interesting. So um, watch it, um, and I hope you've uh, had some learning from it as a Drupal community. Personalization is the future, and data-driven content management should be ambition. So thank you very much. Um, don't forget contribution day tomorrow. Yay. So yay! And don't uh, if you have anything to say about my presentation, you can um, uh, go on the, the the website or via the app. You can take a survey and share your ideas and feelings. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. All right. Hey, hey man, that was fascinating. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. I'm British right. as well, so. Uh, All right. Very, yeah. uh, very intriguing. Um, I agree with everything you said, literally everything you said. Um, right. It's a world dialogue story as well. Um, yeah. My question is more broader, uh, especially in terms of the Drupal for personalization. I think we're behind on that and we need to get up to speed with that. Yes. Um, the broader question for me is should this not be illegal? Um, like, is every election rigged from now on? It is illegal. Uh, we have ruled that most of the campaign is illegal. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, uh, when you watch. Brexit, the great hack, um, you, you'll be seeing that Cambridge Analytica used it uh, in, in many other countries in ways, and I think we should not follow this path. This is a personal opinion, um, and yes, I think this should be illegal uh, by, well, I think lying to people 
you know, and, and I don't know, we have presidents now that, you know, make over 50 lies a week. They're counting them, 50 lies a week. That should not be, not be condoned. Yeah, so, all right. Quite apart from the ethics, as well, being another British person, uh, quite apart from the ethics around using this in elections, yeah. um, I think you've got a very good point around agencies possibly needing to hire data scientists yeah. at least as much or possibly more than marketeers. Yeah. If that's the case, is there something we should be doing specifically look about working out what messaging we should be giving to data scientists specifically on Drupal.org? That's an interesting one. Um, well, I think we should appeal to them in a way that they can become part of the community and help Drupal become yeah. a, this is my personal recommendation, <laughs> data-driven, yeah, there's a lot of personal recommendations, a data-driven content management mm -hmm. system. So if we can do that, you know, we have a very, you know, uh, interesting tool for marketeers. Yeah, so interesting. Hi. Hi. I'm quite surprised at how much this talk didn't talk about some of the ethics related to this, um, particularly someone like Robert Mercer, who's a well-known white supremacist who's been funding things like Breitbart. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, Facebook have already banned quite a lot of the micro-personalization stuff because it's yeah. already been proven to be racist and yeah. other things, and there was a letter yeah. that came out two days ago saying yeah. um, we want to go further and ban it even more, and so that's good. Do you do you think this stuff is even uh, I think appropriate to present if it's something that we shouldn't even be doing? Um, well, I think we all should be aware. And this presentation was about you know I was talking about okay, who knows Dominic Cummings? Your few hands raised. Um, I want the world to know about this, um, and I want to know and discuss within the, the open source community, okay, so where are the boundaries, you know, and yes, uh, personalization, it is already, there's modules within the Drupal community about personalization. Yes, we condone this, this is okay. Personalization, there's nothing wrong with it. The way we use it, that's a key message for every single person in this room within the community and the whole world. And that's something, that's an ethics question, and I think we all should you know, be aware that the, the previous question is, should, should this be allowed? No, this should not be allowed. Personalization, yeah. Where's the boundary? Great discussion. Thank all right, cheers. Uh, hello, I'd like to share some uh, insight about this topic. All right, uh, uh, cool. Anybody know the cross the text table? Anyone? Okay, I'm going to yeah, they have the... New Zealand is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. They started this kind of thing earlier. Now, Cameroon to win the election in the UK. And uh, about two months ago, I found the uh, entertainment. They tried to recruit a group of developers. Huh? So I went to the interview. So I tried to make this information from them. So can I go back to the lessons for uh, online? Online? Oh, yeah. This one? Yeah. So we talk about this. Uh, I think we need to pay attention. The so, use Facebook use uh, online campaign is not as effective as a traditional way. Like the direct mail, uh, phone call, SMS. That's from inside information. So they told me it's more effective, but yeah. cost more. So the advantage for online uh, campaign is uh, you can reach the Number of people with uh, less cost, but not as effective as the traditional way. And can you go back to the? Is the digital uh, alone? Digital is not a, digital alone is not enough. I think. Oh. That was the slide. It's like uh, a big. Uh, uh, this, uh, this one. Uh, uh, this one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you see. Sorry. Uh, go back to the country uh, and the landing. Oh okay, yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we are. This, the, this one? Yeah, this is a uh, highlight today. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's uh, well, the really is uh, is obviously great law, so it was thrown on the bus. And yeah. if you think about the data they covered, the population they can reach yeah. is very small portion. So blame them for trying to win the 
election is a little bit ridiculous. And uh, from inside information, they confirm my guessing. Mm -hmm. And but uh, something we need to pay attention: the data they use is from Facebook directly. So what they can do is to use certain algorithm, for example, <coughs> trusting the users, so they can reduce the cost of the other campaign. For example, for the Brexit case, Brexit has remained two groups, I guess. Uh, I don't need to guess today. Both of them are using the similar way to do that. So all of them have the limited resource cost. So who can reduce the cost? Who will get the advantage? That's uh, uh, data from a Cambridge Analytica use. So that's some insight okay. that I would like to share with you. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Any more questions? Here's a question. Maybe you can just. Maybe you can use the microphone so yeah. it'll be a recorder. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a bit curious about uh, like connecting the the idea of, of what they used uh, in this in this scenario for uh, like Drupal situations. Yeah. Like one of the things I see a lot of uh, uh, businesses do is that they actually start off with the, only the input they they get from their their own client. Yeah. As you mentioned in this story, he actually started off by doing something like a market research. True. So, so yeah. in your way of working with once you do you do you do that market research yeah. before you actually? Yeah, we, we we want to actually talk to the end clients. So, yeah. So, um, what we see is that yeah, you can be well quite successful if you talk to your client, you know, and he provides you with your insights, and I tell you, you come to about eighty percent. But if you want to be truly successful. You need the the, 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 the the insights from the the client's client, you yeah. know. So we sit down with the client clients, you know. We have work groups and everything, uh, interviews, uh, A/B testing, all that kind of stuff, directly with the end client. Then you can be truly successful. Then you get can gain insights. And the interesting bit is is that you know we always sit down with marketers or or data analysts, and then yeah, we have a great idea. You know, we know how it goes, and then we bring in the client, and they bring a total different view, and they're like, what? Uh, yeah. So so bringing in them both together is really really interesting. Yeah, and worthwhile. So it's the twenty percent extra you can can gain. So, all right. Hi. Um, so, contributing and working on open source, we don't, as developers, have control over how our tools are used. But ethically, I think that we are responsible. So, yeah. Yeah. I would encourage us as a Drupal community to think very hard about what tools and what we put out there because yeah. we can't control, even if we change the license, yeah. we can't control what people True. do. True. So, um, food for thought. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Thanks for that. Uh, kind of leading from that, I guess, um, I was just interested to hear, uh, kind of you talk about hiring data scientists to marketeers. Yeah. And uh, so there's, I guess it's all a spectrum you can see it. Yeah. So it's like market research, right? Yeah. And then data science, mm -hmm. and then and then there's kind of like a, the whole sort of AI aspect of it. Yeah. And I was, I was interested where you see the ethical line being drawn against actually, is that too much at one point? Is, yeah. it, is it actually unethical? Again? Well, it depends on the purpose as well. You know, um, I, I had an, an interesting discussion, um, you know, uh, about this subject earlier um, and came to the discussion like, okay, so imagine, you know, um, I've, I've, I was in Indonesia a couple of years ago, and I remembered it. I was there a long time ago. I got back to Indonesia and remembered it as pristine white beaches. So in the morning, I just walk out of my little hut on the beach, and it's just littered with plastic. And I mean tons of plastic. It was just dirty all over. Uh, and I was thinking, like, imagine we, there was a Cambridge Analytica company that could actually change the minds and view of the Indonesian people who are all on Facebook, you know, and we can target them and change their perception about throwing away plastic in the ocean. How cool would that be? Okay, so is this ethical or non-ethical? Yes, it's unethical because we target people in a way that they don't ask for and, and I think this is a very worthwhile discussion we're going to have over the next decade. So where is the boundary? 
um, influencing people in a way they're not um, they don't they're not aware of. Yeah. I think that's that's a really important line, and there's many more lines to define. Yeah, yeah I guess personally for me, I guess an important one would be just truth. Right. But tr yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. that's definitely, that's definitely. That's you should not lie. You know, as I said, you know, there's presidents who lie 50 times a week. Yeah. You know, and we go for it. You know, that, that's personal opinion. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Any more questions? All right. Well, I've been to, I've been talking at DrupalCon for many times. This is uh, this is so many questions I've had. Thank you very much. I love this. And I'll see you next year. Uh, thank you.